welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum, and we're going to be discussing City Council tonight as we do the march up to March's Town Meeting Day. And I've got a special one tonight. Normally I do just people individually, uh, and I already did District 1 individually because we have an open seat, but I thought it would be more interesting to do Districts 2 and 3 together, where we have two incumbent council people and we could dig a little bit deeper because both of them have the experience of sitting in council and barring any sort of massive write-in will be retained on the next city council, I hope. <laughs> to my extreme <laughs> left, so to speak, <laughs> is Jack McCullough and sitting to my lesser left is Ashley Hill. District 3, District 2, how are you guys doing tonight? Doing great, thanks for having us. Living the dream. <laughs> A living the dream of, of having a job that pays very little, puts you in all kinds of meetings, has you in other organizations sitting as the token person. Jeff, which boards do you sit on? The, uh, I'm sitting on a couple right now. I'm the city council representative to the housing task force, which is a natural thing for me because I served on the housing task force and chaired the housing task force for many, many years. And I'm also on the... Uh, ADA committee, which um, ADA being Americans with Disability Act, and we're uh, the city has really made a big commitment to bring all the uh, city facilities into compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, we just, within the last year, uh, hired a uh, consultant to to study all our uh, facilities, and and we got a report from them and. Um, the next step, of course, is figuring out how to fund all the uh, all the changes that need to be done. Ashley, what are you on? Uh, so I am currently the council rep uh, for the Community Justice Center here in Montpelier. Um, and I know uh, the CJC has worked really hard over the last year to put together some additional uh, grant requests to do uh, some more programming in terms of offering uh, communities of support for uh, individuals and families who are struggling here in town uh, and we do also serve a, a number of other uh, municipalities um, as sort of part of our work as a hub here in Washington County um, and I also started uh, worked with the council to put together the uh, social and economic justice committee so I serve as the council uh, representative on that committee as well um, and we just got our uh, charter for lack of a yep. lack of a uh, better word, um, approved by the council. So, uh, what is the charge of that committee? Uh, so it's I, I couldn't quote I couldn't well, I couldn't quote it from memory, it. but um, it, it's really a, a committee that I I pushed hard to form with the council, um, and this council is very receptive to that. Um, to to really start breaking down some of the structural uh, oppression that people of color um, and and other folks who are not uh, often able to be present in the room for a myriad of reasons uh, to really make sure that every voice is represented in the work that we're doing here in city government in Montpelier. Um, uh, you know, um, politics is is a bit of a, a luxury to to have the the privilege and the ability to serve, um, and I want to be mindful that. Um, you know, those of us who, who have the ability and the resources to be on the council, you know, that takes away time from family and that takes away time from work. Um, and I really want to make sure that, that our decision making is informed um, from all perspectives and not just those who can show up uh, and speak at meetings, but making sure that, you know, we have committees who are keeping up on the work that the council is doing and, and thinking about, um, you know, consequences, unintended consequences, impact um, in, in ways other than just a, a budget or, um, you know, a sort of very literal public policy uh, response or issue. Communications. Every year, after the election, <laughs> the city council will gather together and they'll do a mission retreat, yes? Yes. Yeah. And they'll set a set of goals that will shape that year's council agenda, basically. And every year, communications comes up, doesn't it? Yes, indeed. It, it well, I think it does. You know, I've only been to one of these so far, but yes, it's, it's an important... Uh, important thing you know how, how do we get information out to the public how do we get uh, uh, communication and input from the public um, and the city has done some 
big things that are happening or in the process of happening so that uh, people can go to the city's web page. We've got this system called Invisio that enables us to see the status of a bunch of, in, of the initiatives that the city's uh, working on. Now, I have to tell you, I don't know how a resident would go to the city's, city's web page to find it, but I believe that that's part of it, too. Well, I know they're working on metrics on, mm -hmm. on that. Anne had spoken about that. Yeah. And the idea that the city could kind of grab a handle, first on the simples, like demographics and things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, but down the line, you'll actually be able to see much more of what the city is doing yeah. in Invisio. I think that's the purpose behind having it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a couple of uh, last meeting, or maybe two meetings ago, we had a discussion of what, uh, what measures we were going to look at w for this matrix of... Uh, Community performance. Study, yeah. yeah. It, it's in essence sort of like a census for it's a yeah. Montpelier census. Uh, yeah, I believe also if again, you guys know I don't, uh, but I believe we're doing a survey, a community survey yeah. of some sort. Could yeah. you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so um, I think one of the things, uh, you know, as Montpelier sort of looks forward and starts to plan, um, we have some big projects in the works in terms of housing, you know, growing the number of units that we have here in town. Um, you know, one of the things that the city, I think, has really um, been sort of trying to figure out is who do we want to be going forward? And um, so uh, Mayor Watson actually came, came to the council with a, a list of, of indicators, um, you know, and, and it's still a fluid list. We're still working on that. Um, but really what we're hoping is, um, you know, for folks who are interested or, you know, who, who um, may have an opportunity arise to be here in Montpelier, to live here, to work here, um, you know, to raise a family here, um, you know, we really wanted one place where people could go to find that information. Uh, and so the, uh, the city survey will really sort of do that. It'll give the, the survey that went out will give us part of that information. Um, and then we've identified uh, partners in the area who also collect data in terms of health and wellness and um, a myriad of other issues um, that we're hoping to sort of put all together into a, a very digestible, consumable data document for, for anybody who's interested or anyone who has questions or wants to know more about our area. Uh, they'll be able to come and check that out. It should be up on the city website once it's all yeah. been done. And but well, then the other, the but the other thing that I'll mention is that when we were uh, putting together the budget, uh, Bill Fraser, the city manager, said that what he would like to do is have some money in the budget so we can actually do a survey of the population, right, send out questions, see what, what do they uh, like and not like about the city, what would they like, where would they like to see us go. And, uh, and so the plan is to, to do one and then maybe you know, over the next few years uh, build up uh, enough of a fund to do another one. So we're not, it's not something we do every year, but uh, over time, we'll get a picture we'll of benchmark. what people right. want and what how they think uh, the city is doing. Which brings us, of course, when we're talking about things that we need, to the question of affordability in this yes. town. Jack, you've worked for years in housing. You've worked on the housing task force. Is Montpelier getting less affordable? And as it, if it does seem less affordable, is that creating a more a less, a more, a less inclusive Montpelier simply because it's not as affordable. Yes and yes. I can tell, tell you that very easily. When I moved to the Montpelier in 1983, I, on a, a legal aid lawyer's salary, I was able to buy a house for $35,000, which was about twice my salary at that time. There is no way you could do that uh, now. Um, we know that people um, who wor work in the uh, service sector, or even professional sectors, having, are having a hard time buying houses. And we know that rent is, uh, is very, uh, very high. We have a re rental vacancy rate that's almost zero, where to have a healthy uh, rental market, it should be in the neighborhood of 5 to 6%. Um, and 
rents of uh, newly developed market rate housing are up in the uh, clo coming close to two thousand dollars a month. I haven't seen any two thousand, but I've certainly heard of rents seventeen hundred, seventeen fifty a month, and so that's a serious problem. It's not the kind of city that I think we want. Is there anything? Is this? Let me back that off. Is this a Vermont issue? Is this a national issue? How? What kind of issue are we addressing, or is a localized issue to Montpelier? I think I think it's really playing out everywhere right now. I mean, there's been data for years um, about you know how many hours of minimum wage work it would take to to live in any city. We'll just we'll take a national level to start. I mean, the data has been clear for years. Um, I, I think I remember seeing it in 2012 when I was still in law school and. Um, you would have to, in essence, work two full-time minimum wage jobs to simply provide the bare necessities uh, in, in Boston at that time. And that's, that's not even San Francisco or New York City um, or, you know, any, any other larger cities. Um, and Montpelier uh, isn't immune to that. You know, I've, I, am, I think I'm still the only renter on the council. Um, I believe so. And, uh, you know, when I first moved to Montpelier, it took a long time to, to find an apartment. Um, and, you know, uh, it was a rough apartment at that, you know. Um, there, uh, it was a great location, but it needed a lot of work. It was an older house. Um, and in terms of weatherization, that, you know, that was, uh, was not something that had been um, prioritized. And, and so um, my uh, roommate at the time and I, in essence, lived in two rooms for the winter because we couldn't afford to, to heat the place. Um, and so, you know, I am, I am very attuned to, to what that rental market looks like. And, and it is very, very difficult right now um, for renters. And, uh, you know, I think the, the sort of the push to buy houses uh, is is something that myself, for sure, and a number of my peers, um, you know, aren't really in a place in life where we can entertain that. Um, you know, thirty five thousand dollars. I spent double that for a year of law school, mm -hmm. um, and I'll be paying those student loans off. Right, that's basically a mortgage that. forever. Right. You know, that's a that's a mortgage that only dies when you die. Um, so, you know, I think that, that, that there is a very different, um, you know, world out there for, for, you know, people my age and, and even, I would say, you know, people in, in their mid-40s and 50s. And, and, you know, particularly when you get on up to, to folks who are relying on, um, you know, Social Security or, or any sort of fixed income program. Um, there are not a lot of options in this town, and the hard part is when you um, when you are living uh, on a very fixed income, you need access to food and transportation, and the only places where you can find affordable rents that sort of will work with your your very tight budget are not in places that that offer those sort of services. Um, and so I have. Oh, go ahead. See, so we're working on that. You know, we've as. Anyone who's been around Montpelier knows just within the last couple of years, five years, whatever, we've, uh, we've seen some great developments in the housing market. We have the conversion of uh, the upstairs of 56 Barry Street, where the senior center is, to, uh, to apartments. We've, uh, there are other apartments further down Barry Street. Yes. Yes. There's down new the housing down right. there. Yeah. Yep. We have uh, the French block after being vacant for 80 years, now occupied by uh, tenants who uh, had, would have had difficulty affording somewhere else. We've got one Taylor Street, which is the transit center with 30 apartments upstairs that's in construction now. There's uh, talk of a uh, housing project uh, to be developed by the uh, Episcopal Church. Unclear whether that's going to happen. And I can tell you, one thing that we have on the city council agenda meeting for next week is a proposal that we heard about at the housing task force last night to uh, to fund development of accessory dwelling units. What are those? Um, uh, enabling someone to either build a freestanding structure or divide their house into uh, add an apartment to their home, and uh, and the city is being asked to submit a 
community development application to uh, to move forward with with this. It's going to be on a pilot uh, pilot study uh, working with the Vermont State Housing Authority, and uh, it, it's uh, it's a great opportunity to see well what what can we do with people my age and older who are living in big houses and they don't need all the space in those big houses and uh, so what can they do to enable other people to live in those houses take off some of the burden of being in a 3,000 square foot house that you don't need and uh, generate some income. Jack, uh, are there any infill spaces left in this town, in, in, the, in core Montpelier, that you could actually construct a house in if, if you wished? It's pretty limited. We, uh, the city uh, community development uh, office studied that, uh, I'm thinking maybe 10 years or so ago, and the, it's, it's pretty limited. What about, now this is again opening up a can of worms that's been for 15 years, what about Saban's pasture? And what about Alan Goldman's land off on Terra Street? Is there any movement whatsoever on those? You know, I would say I would say that the city is open to to hearing you know thoughts and and plans. I know I'm I'm not aware of anything that's you know sort of a, a done deal. Um, I think the important thing to remember is that those are our privately owned properties, and so you know we've had a good working relationship over the years. Um, in but terms still, of, their profitability depends on zoning, right? Which I think, I think you know, we addressed that. We were very mindful when we did the the zoning rewrite, um, the the last go around. And I know that there were some issues that are still outstanding. We've been meaning we've had them on the agenda a few times, but weather has prohibited um, Mike from being able to join us, and it's not really a conversation we can have without him. So um, I know that there are a few. Um, requests to change things that I think have pretty much unanimous support is my understanding in terms of just some minor tweaks to make to to certain zones and particular um, requirements that I, I'm fairly confident the council is very open to hearing. Um, but in terms of development in the works, I, I'm not aware of any, but I know it's it's an ongoing conversation and has been for a long time. Yeah, you make a good point and certainly in working with the housing task force for many years we've pushed to make it possible to have uh, development on Sabin's pasture and that is included in the in the zoning ordinance we passed to enable uh, that to happen it's it's within the TIF district i believe and we and it's Could actually you explain what a TIF district is please i can try <laughs> the uh, the basic concept, it, it, TIF stands for Tax Increment Financing, and, uh, and the concept is that uh, <coughs> you have an area where uh, the city thinks is, is, is ripe for development, and if a parcel is developed within the, within the TIF district, the, uh, it requires, and it requires city infrastructure uh, sewers. to make it happen. Sewers, roads, water service, that kind of thing. Um, the, uh, the, the taxes that are generated by that property above the previous uh, value of the assessed value of the property go to paying for, uh, for the cost of those infrastructure improvements that are needed to make the development work. And that's what's playing so that's the tax in, the, increment. Um, in the downtown discussion of the parking garage. Yes. Yeah, part of it, yeah. Right. Yep. But so what I was going to say, because is staying on Sabin's pasture, pasture for just a moment, you know, uh, we're part of, part of it is owned by the Vermont College of Fine Arts. I know they're interested in doing some development. We know that... Uh, we have an economic development plan that was uh, developed a couple of years ago, and housing is one of the most important parts of that because the lack of housing that people can move to is a real impediment to, uh, to economic development. Now we have the, uh, the multi-user uh, path going, going by that area. It's, uh, 
I think the time is right to start working on it. It's, it was actually looking at trying to encourage housing on Sabin's Pasture was one of the things that was part of our priorities that grew out of our uh, city council retreat last year, and I'm, and I'm sure it's going to be continue to be high on our list. In terms of, of housing, when we talk about development in our town, it goes beyond that. Uh, the Montpelier Economic Development Corporation, what is that? And how did that come about? And what, it, what, what is their relationship to things like Saban's Pasture? Yeah, so the MDC uh, is a relatively new creation here in town. It's been, I want to say, uh, three, three years? Three years. Three years. Um, and uh, what the MDC <coughs> really focuses on doing is cultivating those sort of relationships that it takes um, to, to bring p businesses to Montpelier. Um, you know, I, I don't think I've been shy over, you know, the last two years on the council in, in terms of how Montpelier handles taxes on businesses. Um, but I think that the MDC really serves a, a very important function in terms of reaching out to businesses who, who you know, we know are looking for places or, um, you know, looking for space or, or looking to move. Uh, and, and really sort of trying to assess what their needs are, looking to see how Montpelier can meet those needs, um, and really be a liaison, I think, between um, the business community and the city, um, while also working you know, with Montpelier Alive to make sure that, that residents are sort of factored into that equation as well. Um, so the distillery would be one example It would that. be, yeah. Of that the distillery out on Barry Street. Out on Barry Street, yeah, the Caledonia Spirits. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I think, and um, I, I've felt this way for a long time, and, and I've been the uh, persistent no vote on, um, on every uh, request to um, abate taxes for businesses. Um, because Why? I, I, well, I, I, it's a multifaceted reason. Um, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to businesses coming here. I welcome businesses coming here. But I think that there are better ways for the city to incentivize relocating to Montpelier than by... Um, you know, to use a, a, a bit of a flippant term, corporate welfare, you know, um, we all work hard here in Montpelier and we all pay our fair share in taxes. And I think that every entity that utilizes resources and infrastructure and benefits from being here uh, really needs to contribute their share. And I know that the argument is, well, they bring people here, they contribute in other ways, but you know, when residents are going to get their tax bill or, you know, when rent is going to go up, when your lease renews because property taxes have gone up, I think it's incumbent upon us as the fiduciary response, you know, those who are, are in a position of fiduciary responsibility to, uh, to the city and to our community to um, ensure that, that everyone who's benefiting from those services is also contributing to make sure that they continue to function. Um, I do think that the city uh, does a lot of great work in terms of supporting infrastructure development so that businesses can come. I know with Caledonia Spirits, the city put up um, and, and is still in the process of um, completing some of the work that needs to be done in terms of infrastructure to really get Caledonia Spirits uh, to, you know, to opening. Um, but I, I really, I struggle with the notion, you know, that, that residents' property taxes are going to go up, but yet businesses um, who, who may or may not have a plan, uh, you know, one of the uh, tax abatements that was granted was um, to uh, allow a, a business to um, rebuild, uh, a, a contractor to rebuild. Um, and, and I appreciate the significance of that because it's going to create new office space, um, but there was no definite tenant in mind. You know, and, and certainly it wasn't the full tax abatement, but nonetheless, um, you know, businesses tend to um, have more access to resources than, than residents do in terms of, you know, the, the long-term cost of being here. And um, I feel pretty strongly that, you know, as someone who works really hard to be able to afford to live here, and I know that my, my friends and my neighbors do, they work equally as hard to, to be able to afford to be here. Um, and it really grinds my gears sometimes to think that, that you know, there are people 
who, um, who are relying on the things that all of us are paying for, but that aren't contributing in, in the same economic way that, that the rest of us are expected to. You are the persistent no vote. I am. Jack, you're <laughs> a yes vote. <laughs> sometimes yes, sometimes no. I Can think, you explain I the think, sometimes yes? I think we've, I think since I've been on the council, I think we've had two stack tax stabilization requests. And one of them was this, uh, office uh, building proposal that came before us that I thought the uh, developer made a good case that uh, that he came within the uh, criteria set forth in the in the policy the no, the no vote and it's long long enough ago that I don't remember all the details but the no vote was uh, was the timber homes uh, company that's the new place out uh, Elm Street and one of the criteria for uh, granting tax stabilization is a determination that this wouldn't happen but for the tax stabilization. And, and the company came to us and they were very forthright that they love the city of Montpelier, they really wanted to move there, their employer, employees wanted to be here, and they were gonna be here doing the project and have bringing their business to the town whether we gave them the tax stabilization agreement Ooh, or not. That's brutal. And so, and so I, I think it's great that they're, they're going to be here. I think they're going to be a, a good uh, asset to the city. But based on that, I just didn't see how we could justify giving them the stabilization. Let, let me twist well, should, this. And, and one other thing about that is that an, another thing we have on our agenda is to look at the tax stabilization policy to see what, how, we can, uh, how we can refine it to make it more, uh, do more of what we want. Let me, let me talk about the TIF district and ask a little bit about that. Sure. If our core downtown, a lot of our core downtown is in the TIF district, then the improvements that are made in that downtown will not go into the general fund, they'll go into the TIF fund, from what I gather, to pay for infrastructure in that neighborhood, doesn't that put more stress on residents who are paying taxes if a major portion of our downtown, its future is already locked away in a TIF? So, I, <laughs> it's a very technical question, and I, so, TIF, I, I, it's, it's a really complex I, I don't even really know what to describe it as. It's, a, it's sort of this, this plan that was hatched as a means to spark economic development, but also sort of allow cities a, a, a bit of breathing room, if you will, to, to be able to support and sustain that infrastructure. And, um, you know, I, um, I was reading uh, the newspapers was many months ago uh, before my grandfather had passed away. And there was a brilliant article written uh, in in the paper in the the town I grew up in about TIF districts, um, and and they've been talking a lot about this. And there was actually a TIF district uh, one town over from where I grew up that failed, um, and there was a really great breakdown in the paper uh, about sort of what a TIF district means and. Um, it, it does take city resources, but it, it uses them in a, in a very different way. And so my understanding, albeit it's, I'm sure it's an oversimplification, um, it, is that it, it doesn't um, mean that upfront the, uh, the, the additional tax burden would fall on the taxpayers. The caveat is, to me, that if for some reason the economic upstart doesn't generate the revenues projected, that I see no other place for that burden to fall but on the taxpayers. And um, you know, I don't, I don't understand the inner workings of of sort of the way that the that the taxes are allocated or um, you know any any of of that. But what I do know is that. Uh, the goal is that those investments from the city will, in fact, be made up for with any revenue generation right. to the grand list, um, and that in theory, 
um, at some point in the future, and admittedly, it is not the short-term future, it is the very long-term future that, that that grand list growth will then go back to the city once the debts and obligations have been satisfied that the city accrued as a result of its infrastructure investments. And I can answer the question in a, in a couple of different ways. I, I agree with everything that Ashley said. One is that uh, the payment, uh, the TIF district does not drain money or reduce the revenue that's already coming to the right. to the city. So it's not it's not causing people's taxes to go up. The the crucial uh, factor that uh, that we heard from our consultants who were preparing the uh, TIF district, and as as we were being uh, being called on to vote on it, was that. Uh, if you throw a bunch of money at projects under the theory that if you build it they will come that's a recipe for failure and that might have been what happened in in the town that you're talking about if uh, if you have are you uh, talking about Newport as well no yeah. no I grew up uh, in uh, on the New Hampshire seacoast with my grandparents and so I grew up in uh, Dover and this was in Rochester right but New I'm Hampshire. saying in Newport that was there was exactly what happened right well there was also fraud right. to an extreme exactly. degree but but the the idea of just uh, like sending a miles worth of water and sewer lines hoping that uh, someone will come along and build at the end of those lines that would be a foolish investment if we had uh, the the only time we would ever actually go forward and say yes we're going to make this investment within the TIF district is if we had uh, a, a developer already there ready to go and proceed with with their development and um, of course it is true that um, it's it's a city bond where we'd be uh, the the voters have to vote on it, and once they vote on it, they're committing to uh, to pay the bond, even if the uh, revenues aren't aren't there from the development. But uh, prudence dictates that you do the you Due make diligence. sure you, you do the develop you know the developments there before you put the uh, infrastructure in the ground. Infrastructure in the ground is a good place to start into three water breaks, water main breaks, within a matter of a month. I think it wasn't it more like two weeks, five, five or six in a month. It could have been. It, it yeah. was significant. I know there was a council hearing on that. Yes. Can you talk to the public tonight about the state of water and sewer in this city and whether there's a possible crisis underneath those those streets? So I I don't know that the word I would use the word crisis. I do agree that we have a significant amount of work ahead of us. Um, you know, I know how hard DPW is working to to deal with these as they're coming up. I we also were presented, and I believe it's all available on the city website now. I think we got it mm -hmm. at at the meeting, really, or emailed just before. Um, but DPW put together uh, a very comprehensive explanation, um, along with some data uh, about the number of breaks, um, both over the last few years and very recent. Um, and, you know, the reality of the situation is that our infrastructure is aging um, significantly. And with the, uh, the drastic temperature increase and in drops, that's causing things to... Well, there's one more, there's one more reality. The, the one that was most visible was the one on Saturday downtown. Where downtown was full. And from what flooded. I gather mm -hmm. uh, from Anne, mm -hmm. um, it was the fact that it was so slushy that the storm sewers... Were, were jammed up. Mm -hmm. So had the storm sewers not been jammed up, we wouldn't have had a flood downtown. It, that was circumstantial in a sense. Well, but it was still a break, a significant right. break. And I, one of the things that's kind of surprising is that it's not necessarily the oldest pipes that have, uh, that have failed. You know, the, out on Elm Street, it was uh, pipes from the 1970s, which believe it or not, are not the oldest uh, water mains in the city. Still and pretty old. Still pretty old. And what uh, the presentation we had from the uh, Public Works Director was that uh, there was a period where the city was uh, making water main, using these water mains, uh, I think it's called high ductile steel, 
and where they used to be cast iron. Right, they used to be cast iron. They went to this uh, high ductile steel, and um, and the issue is that uh, they're it's prone to corrosion in the uh, clay soils that we have in Montpelier. So, so it's a problem where it seemed like it came all at once this, uh, this last month. We didn't really have, uh, we, we're not above the, uh, the ongoing uh, norm. We're all, we always have some uh, water main leaks and uh, and the city has to respond to them as, as we can. We Lack also, well, sort of, but you we know, can't anticipate where these are going to happen. We don't know where they're going to happen, but we also have a capital improvement plan to uh, to address it by by replacing water mains on a schedule based on uh, the best judgment of of where they need to be replaced. You don't necessarily get there before there's a leak, but uh, it's not, we are not, and people should understand that we're not spending so much money on fixing uh, water main breaks that we don't have enough money to, uh, to do the ongoing uh, maintenance and replacement. Now I hope that I'm not gonna misspeak on this. I believe that you were in council when we started to put aside money to get to stable maintenance on the streets. I think that it had been uh, put in place the year before, um, and so I, I want to say, um, I think my, the first budget cycle that I went through was really the first time where there were allocated, dedicated funds to, to for- I think it's 500,000. That is, that is over time, that is the, the plan. Um, and I had raised this issue uh, at council, at the, at the council meeting, I had actually asked that the issue be on the agenda because I received so many um, notes from residents sort of about like, what does this mean? What is the city doing to respond to this? Um, you know, one of the things, and, and I think Tom has raised this a number of times. Tom being? Uh, Tom McCardle. Um, city from our? A DPW director, yeah. Um, we toured the uh, water treatment plant, um, not the water resource recovery plant, but uh, up on the hill uh, where all of our drinking water is processed. And uh, one of the challenges that Tom talked about, and I think it even came up this go around with one of the recent water main breaks, um, was that a lot of the uh, mains were laid before people really started keeping track of where the mains ran and, and what was attached to what. And so sometimes you've got DPW folks out there tr just trying to ascertain even where the break is because they might not have a complete map. That, that was Northfield Street. Right, because those pipes were laid back in the, the early 1920s, um, I think is, is when that could some be, yeah. of them date back to. And, and so a lot of records were lost over time and um, and so you've got folks out there on days where it is well below freezing. I actually walked into town the morning. We had the, the major break in downtown. And part of it was the storm drains, but the other part was it was cold. Big. Oh, way cold. And it, I mean, it started to freeze within minutes. Um, and, and just sort of keeping up with that. Plus, you've got more water flowing in. And, um, and so I think... You know, it's it's there's a lot of moving parts to it. It's a very significant part of, of the Might work we this need to be do. A significant new expense coming in the following years that we're really not going to get federal money for because every city in town has yeah. this problem. Right. I mean, I don't know. I don't know that I'd be comfortable even sort of betting on federal money of of any sort of significance given the sort of uncertainty that that we're experiencing with the federal government alone. Um, you know, I, I do, I, I know that the city has a plan. I, I raised some concern about the sort of time frame for that plan, understanding that there is significant planning that has to go into this. We saw that with the Northfield Street project that had been in the works for a long while, getting contractors, making sure that um, all of the materials are, are in place and that, you know, residents, that, that we've communicated effectively to residents what will happen. Um, but you know, uh, emergencies happen. And I think that that's one of the things that we need to start being more mindful of as we plan and budget because, uh, you know, two major water main breaks like that in downtown Montpelier, there were a couple businesses closed for days. 
Um, and, and so that impacts not only obviously their interests, but that also really impacts our small city that, that hosts uh, up to 20,000 people, I think, on any In given data, day. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's a significant expense. But another way to answer, to look at it is that for some of the major pro big projects that we're talking about where there's a big, uh, big water main that needs work, it's, it's likely to be done as part of uh, a major highway project. And a lot of, the, a lot of our main, some of our main roads are, uh, are eligible for state and federal transportation matches. And so it makes sense to do that all at once. You know, you're, you're doing the road, you're doing the water Well, mains. that was Elm Street and that was Northfield in theory. Yeah, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, I live next to Harrison, which isn't federally funded, and that one took a long time right. simply because, the uh, to amplify on your point, the pipe was going like this, then all of a sudden the pipe zigzagged <laughs> yes. across uh -huh. the street and went yep. like that. No one knew that that would ever be the case. Right. Yep. So one has to wonder how many Harrison streets there are right. sitting in this town. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it is a, a significant, um, I think it's a significant amount of, of work that's going to have to go into planning that. And, you know, it, living on uh, East State, you know, we've had a few of those major breaks where I was walking up the hill one afternoon o over the summer and all of a sudden there is literally a water just shooting out of the middle of the street. I've never seen anything like it before. Um, and, you know, those are, those are the things where, um, you know, we, I think Bill and Sue and city staff have, have responded very quickly, very efficiently. You know, all of that information was on Facebook as soon as you know, within minutes, really. Um, but but in terms of planning for that, I, I, I'm a little concerned that, you know, some of the more major arteries into town, you know, those aren't, those aren't planned to be redone for a, a couple more years. And some of those areas have experienced significant outages as a result of the recent I mean, we're boiling water, that, that's significant. It is. Oh, it definitely is. Um, you, Ashley mentioned the, uh, the city water treatment plant. Uh, I'll just say, uh, if anyone, if you or anyone else has the opportunity to go out there and tour the plant, yeah. it is well worth it. It the, was very, I learned a lot. The operator of our, uh, <clears throat> of our city water plant is incredibly mm -hmm. competent and committed, dedicated to the work. Uh, and that's really true across the board of the, one of the things that I had a chance to do uh, in, early on in my year on the council so far is to visit a whole bunch of city facilities, the public works garage, the cemetery, the water department, and the fire department. And across the board, we have great people working for the city who are dedicated to providing great service for our residents. And uh, I just can never uh, say enough of how, how dedicated and competent our uh, employees are. We're at our debt limit right now. City Council sets a certain target for municipal debt, and we're re we've reached that limit at this point of where past councils felt comfortable in their borrowing. What's your thinking on a recreation center? Because that would really extend that deficit significantly. Um, are there numbers that are being thrown around we received some preliminary numbers at our um, at our last meeting when we uh, went through the presentation with the consultant firm that we had brought on to, to sort of mm -hmm. do the the investigatory study on this. Um, to me, those are the kinds of projects that uh, government is is built to invest in. Um, I, I really believe that rec centers, and as a kid who grew up, you know, that's where I went to summer camp because they had scholarships for low-income families, and you know, that was that was the option. That's where you went. Um, and to me, um, th those investments, those sort of infrastructure investments, and I don't see those as just infrastructure investments. I think those are social investments as well. Um, I, I think that those are the places where we need to invest. And I is that a five hundred thousand dollar investment? Is that a million dollar investment? Keep it's going. It's upwards. Keep going. Yeah. It, it depends on what 
we're looking at. One of the right. things that our uh, consultants did was look at uh, a range of options from <coughs> basically fixing up the rec center to where ADA it can be used, standards. ADA standards and, and make full it functionality. full functionality to bringing the uh, second floor back uh, able to be used for various activities. As well as the all basement. The, yeah. as, all the way up to uh, the idea of an indoor pool and which other people have talked about. And there's a tremendous range from like a million to two million dollars up to, to like 20, 20, 20, 25 million. 25 million, million would represent twice the city budget. <coughs> it has, would any, be, has anyone mentioned that? Well, one of the part of this report was a survey of, uh, of Montpelier residents and um, when, when people got to the uh, point of uh, saying, well, you know, want this, uh, putting in an indoor pool would uh, cost, you know, 350 or $400 increase on uh, the median uh, property tax bill, there was not a lot of support for that. Well, and, and I, I would also, I mean, there, you know, there's still an increase. I, I think no matter how we cut it, there, there would be some assumption of debt in order to either one, retrofit the existing Barry Street facility, or, um, you know, purchasing a, a new facility and and working with that. Um, you know, I don't think there was any support on the council for a, a twenty-five million dollar bond. Um, there was, I think there was a lot of support expressed for looking at options in terms of um, restoring and repairing the Berry Street building, which um, I, I don't, I don't think, uh, the numbers came in at, at, at between one and four million dollars, something, like, something that. like that, two and five. Um, but a lot of that really depends on what the priorities are right. for that space. Um, you know, I love the idea of, of having a pool, but when, what I see in terms of a, a property tax increase, you know, bill to a property owner of, uh, you know, 350 to $400 in, in terms of rental increases, that is significant. Well, the model that they were using was uh, a recreation center in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. where three or $400 on the property tax just simply gets the building built. You still have to belong to that building and pay another two or three hundred for your family. So it seems like those piggybacked figures to actually use it when don't we have a pool up at First and Fitness that's fairly close by and we have recreation equipment up at Planet Fitness for ten dollars a month? Well, that's all going to be part of oh, Go ahead. Well, I, I think I'm playing devil's advocate. Right. Well, mm -hmm. and I think that those are certainly opportunities that are available to some folks, but I'm not interested in building any more opportunities that are only available to some folks. I want to start building opportunity for every single person in our community, regardless of their economic situation, regardless of their ability to drive or to find private transportation to get to places. And, and so to me, really finding a place in town that works. Boy, is there land sufficient <laughs> for that? Well, I, mean, I know. you know. I, Jack was saying that, that in terms of infill, there really isn't a lot of empty mm -hmm. land in town to construct someplace new. But I don't know that it has to be new construction necessarily. I think that there are ways to partner, for the city to partner with existing places. So we've got this building that is very centrally located. There's kids in and out of there after school every day. Um, you know, I used to live right next door to the rec center. It's busy on the weekends, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that to me is really the lifeblood of, of what Montpelier is to the young people that are here and to, to frankly, anybody who wants to do those things. And it's proximate to the to other the, end of the spectrum. Right, to the, the senior, senior center. center. Yeah. Right. And, um, you know, so we have options. I don't, I don't see this as we have to bond $25 million and get everything we want, or we have to just stick with the building on Barry Street and invest in that. I really see this as an opportunity for the city to, one, explore public transportation. What is the city going to do? How, if we as a community decide that the Barry Street facility isn't where we want to invest, okay, I can respect that, but I want to know what the plan is to make sure that every single person who can access Barry Street is going to be able to access whatever alternative the city comes up is with. Is this a multi-year planning project? Absolutely, yes. 
we're, most definitely. Yeah, we're going to hear uh, no, no decisions have been made. The most mm -hmm. important thing that people need to understand is no decisions have been made, and we are expecting people to, uh, to come out and tell us what, what their views are and what th they're willing to pay for. You know, because we've, I think we've all heard from the uh, people who want the indoor pool and those who are in that group are very, very enthusiastic about what they want. Um, but that's one segment of the population. We want to hear from Well, the survey tells you something. It sure, I it haven't seen does. the survey, mm -hmm. but the survey was sci a scientific survey from what I gather. And it'll be on, uh, if it's not already, it'll be on the city's webpage. Well, and I think too, though, that one of the important pieces is, you know, we hear from the people who can show up. And those are really important voices to, to hear from in terms of how we are going to plan our work. But I think we also need to be very proactive about sort of asking. We need to put ourselves out there as city officials and, and as city government to sort of make sure that that we're not only hearing from people who are putting themselves out because the work that we do as a city and the services that we offer impact every single person here, whether they can show up to our meetings or whether they um, you know, are, are invited to come out to another thing. Um, but I think there are great opportunities for people who are working in those, in those, you know, working at the rec center, for example, like, hey, why don't, do you mind taking this really quick survey or, you know, really getting a feel for the people who are using this space who might not be the ones who are able to show up at meetings or, or may have a different perception uh, about what the needs are rather than just inviting those who, who can come in or choose to come in. Um, to, to share their perspective. You know, Ashley, you just mentioned something that I think is very important. It's a, a limited segment of the population who actually come out to meetings and uh, talk to us about what they want. Uh, one of the things that we put in the budget this year for the first time was some funding for, for child care, people who come to city council meetings, for public meetings. And uh, it's, we'll see how it, how it goes. Um, but, but it's a recognition uh, of it's a recognition that, that there are, mm -hmm. you know, if if you're a single parent and you've got there are a barriers. couple of kids, it makes it harder to get out and be heard at meetings. I, I'm going to frame this gently for the elephant in the room, the parking garage, and we've waited this long to talk about the we'll parking garage. We'll call it a behemoth. <laughs> Why did we end up with a 13th hour fight? Why did we end up with after this thing went before the voters, it's still being fought. Was that a, a, a fault in the process, or is that just land policy and regulation in Vermont invites fights? I, you know, I, I'm. everybody knows how I voted on the parking garage. How did you vote on the parking uh, garage? I voted no. Why? I, I opposed it. Um, and it's not to say that I oppose the, um, the creation of a parking garage. I personally and sort of in my capacity as a representative for a significant number of folks here in Montpelier felt like um, this project was not the project that the city um, needed to shoulder uh, as part of the TIF district. Um, to me, um, you know, do we have a need for parking? Absolutely. We absolutely do. But the, the question to me is, is bigger than that. And one, I am, I am all about transparency in the decision-making process. Um, and, you know, there were meetings, and the city put, put out the list of, of meetings that, that occurred on this topic. Um, I personally would have preferred, um, uh, you know, starting these meetings and, and the sort of proposal process much, much sooner. Um, I, I think the other piece here is that um, the, the private entity, so the, the Capitol Plaza, um, you know, they're a business. They are not a, a city entity. They're not um, subject to open meeting laws and all of those other things uh, that, that government is. And um, that, that's one of the things to me that I really struggle with about public-private partnerships is that there's, uh, there is a significant need uh, for transparency in government, but business partners don't share that same um, requirement. And a change like this in downtown Montpelier is major. 
it, it, it will change the, the way that, that you see your community. And, um, you know, one of the things uh, that I think could have been handled better by all of us it was the sort of process by which all of a sudden the, the plans changed and the designs changed. Um, and to me, I want, I want public input on all of those things so that we reach a place so that we get to a yes by having lots of different opinions at the table and, and people weighing in. I want Jack to weigh in because Jack voted yes. I voted yes. I, uh, to answer your previous question, is this just the nature of uh, land policy in Vermont? I think it largely is. I think I'll, we see a lot of circumstances where um, the decision is made and then all the, there, it's always subject to challenge. And, you know, that's a healthy part of our democracy that people can challenge decisions that uh, their government is making. Um, I, I voted yes because in my judgment, and this goes back for many years, I, I've lived here since 1983, and for that entire time, people have been talking about how important, how much we need more parking in, in downtown. Um, as recent, as far back as, nine, as 2015, where we, uh, the city had a study for what was needed for economic development in the center of the city, top of the list was another hotel and a parking structure, basically right where they're going now. And uh, there are suggestions, well, maybe it should go somewhere else. Um, I don't think those are were feasible suggestions. So what I see coming out of this is economic development. We'll have people uh, coming into uh, the city and uh, parking their cars in the parking garage and leaving them there and spending their money in the restaurants and stores downtown. Was there a process question that, that led up, perhaps, as, as Ashley was indicating, that led to a group of people feeling, feeling somewhat excluded? Um, it's hard for me to say, hard for me to endorse that idea because the uh, the people who are challenging uh, the decision were not at our meetings saying, I don't think we're going in the right direction or, or saying it should be fixed or should be stopped. We, di we didn't hear that except from a pretty small handful of people during the meetings that were, uh, that were held. And there were a lot of meetings. You know, the city has been posting uh, the count of the meetings and public hearings and um, well, I, I guess one thing that I, I that that was not clear to to me, and I'm a relatively well informed member of our community, and and you know on the council, um, you know I remember when uh, the the big ribbon cut cutting ceremony happened at at the Capitol Plaza, and the governor was there, and uh, you know the the Bashar family spoke about what this would mean for Montpelier. There was no and I scoured all of the press releases and all of the news coverage I wasn't able to attend because I had to work, but there was nothing in there that, that said the expectation was that, that the city would be building the parking garage and that the Bashara family would be building the hotel. And, um, you know, one of the things that I really struggle with is the city tried. The city in, I think it was 2013, came forward with a plan, you know, saying we need another hotel here. And uh, the Basharas lobbied hard against that. Um, and, and now it's, I think that they announced in 2017 that, that, another, you know, that another hotel was coming and, and that they would own it. And when asked about that, the answer was, well, who better than, than us to own it? And, um, you know, and I, I appreciate from a business standpoint that answer because, you know, that's, businesses need to make money to survive and to continue to do what they do. But I, I also feel like there is a lot of value in, in starting those community conversations at the outset, you know, sort of, okay, the city has decided that this is what we're going to do, and you know I'm a litigator by day, so I I dig my heels in. And Jack, you're a lawyer, you know how it goes. You know when you've got your position and and you know you are you are in your role as an advocate. You know you, you figure out a way to to get to some place and present your case. And 
Um, I, now, I would never stick you guys with this because you're two lawyers and I'm not. <laughs> um, is, it too late for, is it too late for the two sides to mediate something reasonable? I would, I would love to see uh, <coughs> some uh, conversations happen. I've engaged in conversations with some of the opponents. I, I would love to see a way to um, come out of this so that the uh, parking garage can be built uh, because I think it's going to benefit the city. But um, if there are suggestions that uh, that other people have to uh, to make it more congenial to their view of downtown, I think uh, I think the council would be open to. Uh, trying to figure that out. Well, I, would, I really welcome you guys and, and thank you for being here tonight. Both of you are running unopposed, so you don't have to be here talking I to I don't me. know about that. I mean, elections are won and lost by literally one vote. So. Yes, they, exactly. <laughs> you would know better you than would that. know that personally, yeah. <laughs> but I, I do thank you, and, and I, I think we're well represented in both District 2 and District 3 by having you both on council. Well, thank but you for having us. I want to say one more thing, and that's get out and vote. Yes. We know that all of the races are not contested. Uh, there was one thing that, that I didn't bring up that I want to spend two more minutes, and I'm sorry, it's on me. <laughs> the charter change. Yes. What, what, one of well, the which one? Of the, um, the new one? The, the, the one that deals with energy. Sure. Mm -hmm. Would one of you two explain that very quickly? That's yeah. on me, sorry. Yeah, so um, the proposal on the ballot is uh, language that we would take to the legislature that would allow the city uh, to explore creating uh, energy efficiency standards. I know that there was an article, a, a piece on CAX, where um, a lot of it sounded as though that was sort of a, a done deal, but I, this to me is really the beginning of that conversation. This simply gives the city the ability to explore the drafting of ordinances if the legislature approves the charter change. The city is looking for the authority from the voters to request that the legislature accept the proposal to, to amend the charter. Um, and then what would happen is a long series of community conversations to talk about what those requirements could look like, how they should be structured, if we should even structure them. I, I think that- It we, opens the conversation. It, it opens the conversation, uh, and that's a public process. Again, one of the things that I think is, is, is pretty important, Kate Stevenson from the uh, Energy Committee had a post in Front Porch Forum today, I think, and <clears throat> she said, look, we have a net zero goal. And if you're, if you're gonna set a goal and then hope to get to it, you're gonna need to start taking some steps in that direction. And addressing the ability of, uh, to create energy efficiency standards is one of the things that we need to start moving on if we're gonna get there. Now you're talking about municipal energy efficiency standards. Well, I and, think, and community. And community, yeah. Mm -hmm. Privately owned uh, property of developments, uh, new developments. Uh, so communication would be absolutely central when yes. you're talking about people's own property. Yeah, and that's something I know that the city's been working on, and I, I think things have improved exponentially even in, in my time on the council. Um, and I think in the world that we live in, it's a lot easier to get information out. It's just a matter for me of making sure that people are consuming that information. Um, and I think a lot of that means that we're going to have to retool our approach to how we're how we're talking about issues and and how we're you know publicizing that these are the things that are you know that the council is taking up, um, and you know we've we've asked for. Uh, an opinion um, about sort of what an electronic message board could could look like, you know, in conjunction with public meeting laws and things like that. Um, because I, I really do, I, I like Richard said, you know, voting is literally the most important thing that you can do. Um, and, you know, that's, that's one way, one way for us to sort of get the pulse of our community. You know, Jack and I and, and every other member of the council, we're engaged, you know, we hear from folks all the time. We do our best to keep up with emails, but there are so many some days. Um, and, you know, it's really hard for us to, to keep up with all of that. And, and then, you know, on top of that, it's, it's trying to keep on top of, of what's next and, and how people are interacting with us. We gotta be better about it. So if this charter change were to be accepted by the voters, it would go on to the council's goals? Uh, well, we would, in order we to- are, it, We already have a goal of right. this net zero, it's, it's achieving energy So this would be a ways to 
to get to that to goal. If yeah. the legislature the of itself. approves right. it, though. Right. So it's not a, it's, even if the voters vote yay. And the legislature has to approve it because we're a charter town. Correct. So any charter change for municipality has to go through mm -hmm. the legislature. And, you know, that it could be an uphill battle there. You know, it's, it's never really a done deal, I think, until that, that it's, last vote it's in the legislature is cast. Um, you know, so, so this is the starting point. We are literally at like point A1 with having this on the, well, I would say A1 was getting, you know, the council uh, to approve it and, and warning it on the ballot. Step two will be the election, step A2. And then, um, you know, we'll but see where it goes from there. But we already have some charter changes that have been passed by the voters that are waiting in the legislature, and and there's some some important important things. We've got the uh, plastic, bag. plastic bag ban. What about Berlin? Berlin Pond. That's, nope, that was no. That's that was not, not one of the not mm -hmm. on the list. But nope. but but the other thing is the is the non-citizen voting in municipal right, right. elections, and uh, and so the legislature is going to decide whether to approve those. Now, after a false ending, I'll get to the <laughs> real ending and say thank you so much for watching this. Watch all the other ones. The one with Jim Murphy talking about the school budget is a very good show. The one with Ann Watson talking about the city budget. Every one of these is good. Get out on town meeting day and do vote because your vote does mean something. But more, get into the habit of voting because that's the lifeblood of our democracy on every level. Thank you for watching.